are you up to? That's my boat down there. The camouflage. Anyway, guys, what's the documentary for? Look at me. Ah! I'd be a pirate. Ah, pirate, I'd be. Ah! Please, you want to see something really weird? I would say I'm kind of a, like a river womble in a way. I find stuff, I've managed to forage because some providence and good karma makes me find the, the tin of soup if I need it for the day if I go out hungry. Or, yeah, yeah, so or the ten pound note flowing in the wind. I think, oh, I must have done something good today. So yeah, a lot of time foraging for our materials. And yeah, especially gathering wood in the winter. You get to know you get to know the trees. I, I get especially when the wind goes. I get a, such a stack of wood. Then I mainly go along the cycle paths, get all the wood from there first, and that's that's good for a few days. A friend of ours, a very modest man, and he used to disappear a couple of winters ago, and we could hear the buzzsaw going, chainsaw, and we thought he was doing a lot of firewood, and lo and behold, we have appeared up there an alligator or crocodile in the backwater. And then came a Winnie the Pooh. Then came various hares and rabbits and otters and flower pot men. And Geraldine the giraffe, who's our latest arrival. And uh, people always say, who is it? Who did it? And we refer to him as the River Banksy, because he's a man of mystery. And my friends call me Jeppo. Um, I'm a healthcare assistant but I've got a hobby of kayaking, which I've been doing for the last four years. One day I walked in the shop and seen an inflatable kayak. I thought, I'll have a piece of that. Bought it, chucked it in the river and started off. I enjoyed it so much being on the water and meeting the people. Uh, I just decided to keep with it. I'm Peter Osborne. I'm the manager of Bourne M Marina. I've um, been in this role for just over 15 years. Richie, how do I drive it? What do, what do I do? 15 years this year. It's nice, peaceful, lovely bit of and life. And what does your job on a normal day entail, roughly? Painting, varnishing, craning, towing, swimming, yeah. <laughs> drinking. Yeah, we like a drink. The Bounty Public House is very important to the River Thames. It's establishments such as this that give um, a target for boaters to go to when they go on the river. I don't think there's, there's enough places such as the Bounty, which is a bit quirky, and in my opinion we could do more of, of these sort of places. A lot of people arrive um, uh, in their boats and come in with a, you know, a new flag or a, a German helmet they've found in their loft or something. But, uh, we nail everything up on the wall. <laughs> found a lamb once who cooked it. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Swan was eaten all over the country and it was really served up at banquets and feasts for really dignitaries. And in those days, of course, it was a very, very important food. and in, out and in, and fins and a tail that help them swim. The fish in the sea are the fish that are free. The fish around the lake never swim straight. The fish in your pond are the ones that you're fond of. The fish in the bowl are orange called gold, and the fish on a hook are the ones that you cook. Smash it again. Thank you, George. I'd like a little floating market for food stores, I think it'd be really cool. Um, that's what I'd like to achieve. My flotilla. <laughs> we'll have to see what happens. I'll just uh, switch this off and uh, go back to my full time, six months a year career as a chimney sweep. We've got the Whippet Kitchen, yes, believe it or not. it's. Uh, it's a lovely thing. Again, it's something that it was a tradition for 27 years with the old lock keeper that you could buy an ice cream at Abingdon Lock. <laughs> a 
and when Richard took over, um, they got permission to do it again. So the tra tradition carries on, and local people love it, as you can see today. It's lovely. We were moored at Henley during the Henley Festival, and one group had a rubber duck, which must have been about 20, 25 feet tall. What style? I mean, that's great, but it's just great fun, isn't it, to do things like that. So you see odd, oddball things like that. There's some big giant balls called water orbs that you roll about the water in. They're like big hamster balls. Blow them up around you and you roll them about on the water. On a paddle pool, not on the river, because that might be taking risk a bit too far. Amphibious cars are the only way to travel actually. We're here at the International Amphib and today we're in Marlow in the park and it's just been a wonderful day. We've been swimming all the way from Henley down to Marlow and actually we've been taking a few shortcuts on and off slips that we found on the way. Um, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, this particular amphibious vehicle by Gibbs, the Aquada, is actually one of the fastest you can actually buy. So we do about 35 knots on the water and about 100 miles an hour on the road. So a friend of mine, Lyndon York, mentioned that this event was happening last year. So I thought, whatever I do, I need to get myself an amphibious vehicle in time for that, which is what we've done. And it's been a brilliant, brilliant time, so I'm really glad they managed to borrow one. In fact, they've actually got a bigger one behind the Humdinger, so that's the next model they're working on as we speak. My very first amphibious experience was at St Michael's Mount when they had a duck, which is like some of the bigger ones you can see right at the end there. And then we did, uh, on Wheeler Dealers years and years ago, we did uh, an empty car, which we actually restored, and that was fantastic fun. We had to do the test swim, if you like, on the Thames, just by Windsor Castle, on one of the high, heaviest flows of water, just after the flooding and uh, we actually broke down because we were trying to go upstream chasing a camera boat going too hard on it. But I mean, it's such a wonderful thing. Once you've been in and out of the water, you know, in one vehicle, it's just a wonderful experience you just have to go again and again on. But I think, again, I'm, I'm going to have a bit more of a dabble and of course then everybody's going to have to buy one of my cars as well. We started in 1987 in Holland with a small group of ducks that went from England and we took four over there, and it was really a military event. There were some, it was, as I say, it was in Holland, and there were Dutch GPAs, amphibious jeeps there, and a couple of civilian amphibious vehicles. And we had so much fun that we thought, let's do it again next year. And it's grown to now, we probably have 65 vehicles here. You can go in at Henley and you can go down the river 10 miles and come out somewhere else and just drive home. But I thought I'm going to get something myself and I'm not into anything military. I don't like green stuff. So the, the Amphicar, which is now 50, 55 years old, attracted me. It looks good. It's a car you can use on the road as well as on the water. It, uh, it's a four-seater, 60s convertible car that goes in the water. And you have to really use the same means of propulsion on the water and on the road. Uh, nowadays, it's moved more from propellers onto water jets, but I like prop propeller. But because of the mechanical nature, the, the hobby does attract people who like to make their own things, and this is an example. This, this is a floating Citroen that this chap from Holland has made and he comes, come, come, he, he, he comes at all the rallies and it keeps up and it goes into locks and doesn't break. It's never sunk, but it's full of foam, I think. You know, a car should not really naturally go in the water, should it?
I think it was quite a surprise to a lot of the people to come here and find the river so raw and so narrow and lovely houses. That's what's impressed them, is the money along the river. All these beautiful houses with lovely sweeping lawns coming down to the river. It is exciting when you see 65 vehicles on the water, on a river. There's a guy here who has, a, has an amphibious bath chair that he's, he floats about in. And it has a phonograph. And a, but he is a member of the English Eccentric Society, so that's no surprise. This is a 1930s electric Argosan bath chair, which was an early form of invalid carriage. I've converted it uh, to go on the river on a couple of floats here in a special frame. And it's got various um, ancillaries, accessories, and eccentricity. Um, we have uh, a wind-up gramophone built into this float here, so we get nice music as we're going up down the river. We have uh, my little friend here, the pigeon clapping away. This keeps the rain, the sun, and the snow off. Plus various other devices to help people in distress on the river, or me in distress on the river, including uh, a drink here. <laughs> My name is Richard Owen, uh, aka Ant Blues, and I drive the Blues Brothers Bluesmobile. Every time I go out, you see smiles, and uh, you know, when everybody sees the Bluesmobile and the music coming out the uh, horn there, it's fantastic. Since I was 12 years old, uh, me and my uncle would go toting, we'd, uh, we'd have a great old time. most relaxing time you will ever spend and also along the river you've got uh, loads of different things going on activities you know through the summertime um, you know and it's a, a different stop every day you know you don't look at the same thing every day you move on you, you go to a place then you move on and there's more people to uh, interact with I try and get there every other week to just hire a boat out and just just go cruising and you know as I say it's nothing like it in the whole world it, it, it's fantastic you do meet a lot of different people and characters and sometimes we even play Blues Brothers for them. We do uh, do a couple of shows for them on the riverbank. It's a good community uh, which is what it is lacking in uh, life these days. There's not a lot of community about and when you're on the river people are totally different and there's a big community spirit there. Yeah, I I've seen a lot of um, amphibious vehicles the other week I saw an, um, a Back to the Future car uh, on the river. It was, it was fantastic. The, and I think, you know, I think I might follow suit with my car, as I say. Yeah, make it uh, sort of an aqua vehicle. You know, and we'll have all the famous cars on there. <laughs>
Yeah, they're beginning to know me now. You know, they know the car. I'm all, I'm all up and getting me blues mobile. And uh, yeah, they do recognise me. They call me, uh, they call me Elwood. Life is good. River's good. People are good. And you know, I'm having the time of my life. You know, I love all that. I'm Ian Cook. And I'm Sam, his boy. We basically just look after him. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, well, I sort of grew up on the river. My father worked for the Thames Conservancy. He was there. Area chief diver um, for the Reading area, um, so I, you know, grew up pretty much on the on the water. Definitely, I mean, you can you can tell like the old school communities, you know, mm. I mean, they're all just they're all smashing people, characters as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, go back yeah. to the good old fashioned stuff, yeah. yeah. And there's so many really nice people and places on the river. To, you know, if you've got a small boat, I know of a few places where you can just go and anchor up for the day or the evening. And it is truly the most magnificent place or places in the UK, in my eyes. Probably a bias, probably a biased oh, yeah, view, but definitely. Yeah, I mean, there's things that you can experience on the Thames that you can't anywhere else. Yeah. It's, it's just a completely different environment. It's lovely, so. it really is. I love it, you know, absolutely. It is my life. It really is. Been on the Thames now for 30 years, come next month. First boat was a Shetland 18 foot on a trailer, which we used to put in at Natch Lane. This is a particularly nice mooring because it, it, it's owned by the National Trust. It was, it was called the Anchor. It was to the right of the cottage and back a bit. Yeah, and, and this cut used to go all the way round and back out again, um, but, but it's been lost. Apparently, the, the, the guy had a roaring fire, and uh, the, the, the pub caught fire, and um, went up in, 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 in flames and a big explosion. Now, apparently, I don't know if it's true or not, the military of defence come and the, the land was flattened within 24 hours and they reckoned it was an Exocet missile. Apparently the tin act was found two miles away. Yeah, and the land was flattened within 24 hours. It's full of characters, uh, so many characters that you wouldn't really credit it. Everyone is different and they do become friends in the end. 
Stories, we've had um, a lovely lady from Canada and um, we told her about the crocodile and so bless her, she went up to see the crocodile and instead of standing in front of it, she stood behind it in the mud and gradually sank to her waist. And when we got her out, eventually, I said to her, you'll never forget your visit to Abin. And no, she said, he was filming me as I was sinking. And so we, we literally had to scrape her off of this gray mud. And she, lovely lady, she was laughing all the time, wrapped her in a blanket so the hire car wouldn't get dirty, and away she went. A more recent um, change is, is the locks. Every lock in the old days um, used to have a resident lock keeper. So that lock keeper was always available to help fill the lock correctly um, and speed people's um, transit through the locks. Some of the locks now um, are unattended for occasions and there are quite a few lock keepers who are not residents at their locks. Now this causes a few problems and it can help delays on busy days because the locks aren't packed as, as tightly as they once were. I'm fascinated by people like Heath Robinson and Emmett and anyone a little bit unusual. Oh, look at that. No, look, look. It's got a hole in it. This is Voltenic. Having built a couple of previous river machines, I wanted to do something a little bit different. And it seemed to be performing okay. And as I was going up the river, Henry Rigatta sat to thousands of people everywhere. And then my backside started getting wet and I realised it was going down. By this time, the water was up to about here and uh, running out of options. So I beached it, um, left it there till the Monday after we got it, and then took it to pieces, brought it back here, and that was the end of that run. So we're stood by the River Thames, a little backwater of the River Thames, where we've got uh, kayaking, canoeing, bell boating, dragon boating. We do raft building, so you can build a raft and sail it across. And that's a scout group that is staying with us. Um, and you can, there are no facilities on the island, so if they need anything, they have to come across to the, to the mainland. So it really is a swallows and Amazons experience. Yeah. yeah. And we've got sailing and rowing down the far end. Rowing is probably our biggest growth sport. Well, I grew up as a kid on a narrowboat. My parents had a narrowboat and we went all around the canals in the Thames. And it sort of kind of gets into your blood. Once you've been on a boat, you just sort of need to have boats. So uh, we bought a house down here in... Well, originally we lived on a, a, a converted cricket pavilion on an island at Henley. 
and you could only get there by rowing. Boat was the only access. So we wanted something that was similar to that because I just enjoyed being a kid so much. Uh, and we found the house here, which is lovely. It's a very similar spot. Uh, it's not an island, so we've got the advantage you can get to it by car. But it's just peaceful and idyllic. And under an hour from London. Actually, I can still remember being on the Clifton Reach when I was a kid. And you go down there now, and it's virtually unchanged. Uh, obviously, some of the houses are a bit bigger. There's a, the houses tend to be of a different style, and some of the older, more ramshackle houses have gone. But really, from Windsor upwards, it hasn't changed that much, and that's part of the charm of it. You know, it's just a really peaceful, uh, peaceful place to live. I have worked on the river since I was 15 years old, a long time ago. And I love the river, it's a super place. Thames, I think, is an absolutely unique place to be. Um, it's um, used by everybody. It's used by walkers, people on bikes, fishermen, canoeists, kayaks, now boats, cruisers. It's just a unique place to be and everybody is so friendly. The people, there's such a sense of community. You meet some lovely characters along the river and um, very colourful people and that's what I enjoy and those who don't fit in society fit into river life very well um, and, and I think I'm, I'm in that gang as well so yeah I enjoy that. Bonded together by a common interest um, it's the people that attract me. It's a great asset uh, and it's it, there's something about being out on a boat that imposes a tranquility. We are in the best place I think you can find beautiful river and um, just this lovely scenery. We went in a boat, two hours go by in the best sense. You don't even check your phone, you don't worry about anything. So it brings people together. You can do with family, just have sort of sandwiches on there. And I think it's one of the most relaxing things you can do in this country, yeah. Beautiful, you, you, you sit here and have a pint, something to eat, and just watch the boats going up and down. It's, uh, it's, it's so much nicer than sitting in a high street boat. I advise everyone to come down and have a pint. <laughs> There's something about water that attracts people, and once you get into it, but it's, it's stunning all round here. I think um, Cookham and round this area are probably the two best stretches. Maple Durham, another really nice stretch. It's a lovely reason to get up in the morning. Always something different, uh, if it's people or boats, or the amount of traffic one day to the next. But whatever it is, it's always interesting. Always interesting and a beautiful place to be. <laughs> um, I've, I've seen a couple of bums working on the river <laughs> and other bits. <laughs> Aquadogging. I don't know what to say about that. But, you know, I think whatever, whatever floats people's boat, quite literally, I have no problem with it. If you want to be a naturist, just go nuts. <laughs> You know, I'm not, I'm not I'm, quite literally. I, I don't have a problem with that, so. <laughs> I don't see any nudity on the river. If you can tell me where it is, I'll go and have a look and let you know. <laughs> there, are, there are people that swim naked in the river here. Um, I may have been one of those. <laughs> um, each their own, whatever you like to do. But I, I, I wouldn't say there are any, um, Naturist clubs here. There's people that use the river here, but I don't know if naturism is uh, is one of the the categories that visit Newbridge very often. You do create very good, funny memories. Like I, you don't ever not have a good time on the boat. I think it's just part and parcel of being on the river, being with your friends. So yeah. Like going down Windsor, you know when more enough up Windsor there's very rarely any spaces. And it was coming to about 7 o'clock and we were having a night out in Windsor. Couldn't find any spaces. The boat was coming this way, I was coming this way and the space was over there. I sort of made my over and he was looking at me and somehow we both went for the space and I sort of 360 the boat and just slid in. And he couldn't get angry, he was just so impressed by it. How I did it to this day I'll never know. And he just went and just clap me and then just move, so that was probably the best thing I've found. <laughs> hey, man, with the camera. I just was a little bit uh, sad that all of the boating events took place on the Henley Reach, and I really wanted one on our reach. So we thought we'd start an illuminated parade where we all gather late evening, uh, and everyone puts lights on their boats, and there's no rules really. Um, 
and everyone chooses a theme uh, and drifts slowly down to the local pub where it's judged. Uh, the winners get some completely inconsequential trophy, uh, but it's just the fun of taking part and it is a really magical sight as these illuminated boats drift quietly by. It's very ethereal uh, and it's just, it's special spectating and it's special taking part. Well, I think you have to wait until the evenings are dark enough to have the effect but on the other hand, not so cold that the spectators freeze to death <laughs> while they're watching. And also, it's very nice that it's held at the local pub as well. The Bounty is a very special place and we're very lucky to have it. been raised. If anyone wants to come in next year, they're really going to have to make an effort. I mean, there was some fantastic craft there. We had the Batmobile, we had the tank, uh, we had the dragon, we had angels, and some, I mean, huge barges. We had a really great selection of boats, and it was just a fun evening and fireworks. The overall prize goes to the Batmobile! Yeah! I think we're going to have to do this next year. I think this is going to, this is going to have to become an annual, uh, an annual event. There's probably 120 people here, 140 people, and it's just been a really great, great evening. That was very good. Well done. Yeah, I see that uh, advertised, so I decided to bling my kayak with all these lights, and uh, I, I enjoyed the welcome so much. No, I kept them on there for Christmas and uh, I've been uh, using it also for Christmas and uh, I've let Santa borrow my kayak as well. Merry Christmas! I feel like a bit of a celebrity. Uh, I'd never do it without a beard if I was Santa um, but he likes it and uh, he gets lots of attention and a lot of mobile phone footage. And when I take Santa out in my kayak they go absolutely mad. Season's greetings to you. I took it to the Oracle shopping centre in the Kennet and uh, all the kids and adults alike were waving. Swan Up in dates right back to the 12th century. Um, of course, today, Swan Up in is all about conservation and education. It is a journey from Sunbury on Thames all the way up to Abingdon. It's around about 79 miles. Yes, yeah, Swan Up in takes place in the third week of July, or thereabouts each year. People often ask, well, why is it the third week in July? Well, it, it is a bit of tradition. And Swan Up in week is a very, very busy week for us, and there's a lot of people come down to visit um, Swan Up in at different locks. They come to the locks to see the Swan Uppers. You have some TV presenters or celebrities there. Uh, Martin Clunes we've had, um, we've had Ben Fogel, Maureen Lipman, um, lots of people like this. There's a person in the front of the boat in one of our skiffs that we shout out. And that is the signal for all the Swan Uppers in the six traditional rowing skiffs to circle round the family of swans. We will then work the boats in closer and closer together.
we will lift the swans from the water with the young cygnets. We will then take them ashore. We will weigh them, measure them, and check them for any injuries. After we've taken all the data from them, they will have a small British ornithology ring put on their leg to, so we can collate the data of all the swans and then they will be put back in the water. The swan population does vary over the years, all sorts of different things, from floods on the river and vandalism. When Her Majesty the Queen came along, she travelled in the steam launch Alaska from Bovney Lock. She travelled from Bovney Lock all the way to um, Oakley Court. Yes, Swan Up Inn is a royal event and naturally we're doing a good job for the river. We have wildlife, we're protecting the wildlife. And hopefully Swan Up Inn will continue for many, many years. It's been going on since the 12th century, so I'd imagine it will carry on for a few more years. What I find amazing is you find this really big aggressive swan and the minute they get hold of his neck how they go completely docile and just become yeah all right they're gone <laughs> they're not going to go anywhere and they just give yeah. in when you see this one up and you realize it's a bit of a myth about how dangerous the swans are because actually providing you're not threatening their young they're actually they're okay apart yeah. from the odd rogue one. Yes, there are a few black swans on the River Thames, um, mainly at Reading, Caversham area. They've all escaped from private collections. They shouldn't be there, 
They're not indigenous to the United Kingdom. They come from Australia and New Zealand. There is a dark side to the Thames and it can be very dangerous at times. The more major incidents, uh, either caused by high speed, um, which we, we've seen at least one, um, and the other thing that, that can happen is with the petrol boats, unfortunately um, they, they can explode every now and then. Welcome to Ditton Skiff and Punting Club, where I do all my skiffing. But the claim to fame is that in 2005, uh, my fifth world record, I set off from Letchley Bridge and rode the length of the Thames single-handed, non-stop. That's 165 miles down to Grade 10 Royal Pier in a time of 43 hours 40. It's only been done once before and I've managed to beat the uh, time set by the Vesta rowing man in uh, beat his time by 16 hours. We try now to create ceremonial events using traditional boats where we can. The river, bless it, even sort of surprised me one day. I was skiffing back up from Richmond and it was um, sort of yellow to red boards, strong wind and quite a lot of waves. And the river lifted the stern of my skiff and the bows went straight down, so I sank. Yeah, it can happen to the best of us. love messing around on boats and just seeing people. I mean, obviously now it's uh, great fun organising events and seeing people out there rowing. And so long may that last. It's just very quiet, peaceful, good for your soul, I find. <laughs> just quietly. Go out there. I used, sometimes when I used to work in my previous career down at Kingston, I used to row to work and uh, afterwards enjoy a gentle paddle back and just let the stresses of the day quietly disappear. Uh, I recommend it to everyone. Yeah, I think there could be more things happen on the river, I don't know. The trouble is, we find because we're involved in it, everything happens around Henley. You know, you have various other little regattas, but it's just a, a one-day thing and gone. Why can't they have, you know, other events, just a few bits and pieces, you know? It was great when um, you had the Golden Jubilee. Yeah, yeah, Jubilee. And they had the procession, just 
up, upstream here. Oh, that was nice, seeing lots of people, you know, lots and lots of boats there. Everybody yeah, seemed rallies. happy. I remember a, a story my father told me years ago. He was at Sonning Lock, and an uh, American chap at the time said, you know, how clean's the river? And uh, he said, lovely and clean. And this guy said, I bet you wouldn't drink it. And my father said, yes, I would. He said, it's clean enough to drink. So this guy gave him the cup, and Dad sort of swished it around in the water, and this bloke said, what's up? Clearing all the contaminants off the top? He said, no, I'm just washing the cup. <laughs> It's called Laurel. It's the last wooden humber kill left in existence. It's been derelict for years. There, there were squatters all over the land there. It's almost like a shanty town there. But I was allowed to stay, so I wasn't. They, they could see I wasn't so toxic. They gave me a contract for one pound for six months. At the, at the time, I couldn't afford a pound, so I don't know who paid it, but it's only a pound, I guess. It's such a diversity of people living on the river, from from bricklayers to top architects. When we bought our house, we looked at about 30 or 40 riverside properties. And it's amazing that in about 20 of them is apparently where Wind in the Willows was written. <laughs> Everyone says, it's this willow tree. I don't think so. In the winter, I actually read books, I sit by my fire, I'm quite content. I've got enough solar power to charge my phone and run LED light to do reading by. I'm trying to figure it out so I can have a light here with, and keep working with the artwork with the right colour and the right shadow. There's an artist called Brassai in France who done scenes of Paris in the night. I'm quite inspired by this guy. I've seen some of these gin palaces, the, the real kind of expensive looking things with all sorts of inflatables at the, at the end of them and, and kids being dragged along in the river. That, yeah. that looked like quite, quite fun really. You know the river, it's pretty wild here. We've got wild meadows and it's the River Thames and um, as nice as, uh, as the River Thames can be elsewhere, this is still wild here, you know, we're, we're as um, natural as it can be. We've got the resident swans who are also hissing. Yes, yes. <laughs> Hiya. And um, yeah, it's just unspoilt meadows and beautiful landscapes, lovely skies and lots of space. And um, on the personal um, appreciation of this area, I, I think we've got something really special. The bridge here was built in 1188, I've been told. Um, this is the oldest bridge on the River Thames. It's called New Bridge. It's a beautiful bridge. It's listed in the same status as our castles are. It's a beautiful piece of architecture that should be looked after. And lots of lorries that do use it, um, use it in the early hours of the morning because they know they can get away with it. I'm passionate about this area. I feel like we're just custodians of this area. Naturally, the river brings interesting people and also interesting uh, hobbies so there's always people on the river playing on boats and uh, whether these guys are experienced or not is a, another matter and sometimes you see boats sideways on the bridge you know somehow manage to turn sideways before the bridge and get stuck it's very entertaining for all involved <laughs>
and eventually everybody has a drink to, to celebrate that they survived. Just only water. He was fed up in London and he, and he just said to me, I've had enough. I said, what do you want to do? He says, a man here. Going, it was on the Thames, wasn't it? Going on a boat and he said, uh, He's got a good life. I said, has he got a beard? And he said, yeah. I said, well, you're halfway there then. So we're going to do it. <laughs> so that was it. We moved out of a five-bedroom house to do this. Uh, and we decided just to get rid of everything, either to family or to sell it or whatever. And we've got everything we need on the boat. The modern hire boats are pretty well equipped. You've got virtually everything you want on there. There's television if you get a rainy day. There's not many hardships on a modern hire boat. Some have... Um a sewage storage tank on board so you have a flush toilet and it goes into a tank and you come along to somewhere like here and what we do is we have the, the capability of pumping the sewage out of the tank and it just goes off into the mains. Well, we had one guy in and while I was getting the equipment ready he said um, I'll open the deck fitting. Fortunately I was fiddling around doing something as he undid the deck fitting and I think he must have been quite full because it literally exploded out the deck and covered him in um, effluent. With a low explosion you're relying on something expanding and then bursting. It's happened to staff here where they've got covered in the brown substance. Um, but if it's a nice sunny day, um, I think the immediate action drill is to just jump in the river. Where it's like a blast of baits and a shower shit overborn end. A classic, a classic one was at Reading when there was a boat there which was, it, it was actually for emptying all the uh, sanitary stations along the river, you know, so it was full of, you know. <laughs> and, it had, and it had about 40,000 gallons of that stuff in it, this great big tank on a, on a big barge, and they sank it, and it was sunk right outside the Environment Agency building in Reading. And I know the boss called me up and he said, oh, and he was in absolute panic, wringing his hands. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What an advert this is, you know. I said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And we went down there. And as luck would have it, the air valves on top of the tank were just above water. So I phoned up the uh, sewage tanker people, you know, Thames Water sewage tank tanker people, and they came and parked the other side of the river. And we pulled their hoses right across. Joined them on the pump, joined them on the connections on the tanks, and they pumped it all out into these big tankers. And the whole barge with the tank on it gradually came up as we got rid of the stuff, and the air went in the top. And we never spilled a drop. We had a commendation for that one. You, I've seen a submarine go by. Uh, you see all sorts of stuff going by. So I saw a garden shed go by once, uh, and there's one of our neighbours has got a very interesting six-wheel, uh, six-wheel craft which drifted away in the floods. So yeah, lots of interesting stuff. One of my friends uh, rung me and he, he said, Peter, he said, uh, my boat sunk up at Longridge, which is just upstream from here. And I said, uh, don't be daft, don't wind me up at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning. He actually had. Uh, we went up river um, where I did see the sunken boat. We tried to pump her out, but it, it wasn't actually happening. He caught his bow rope, which had gone around the propeller, and there was a hole the size of a dinner plate. In the middle of the river, it's quite difficult to know how to plug it. His wife had these brand new pillows still in the packages that were floating around inside. So to her dismay, we actually ripped these open and stuffed them in the hole and that had the desired effect. So the, we got the boat up to the surface. So we towed it alongside the tug back to the marina so where we had someone ready with the crane. And not only at the big, was there a big hole in it, but the rudder had disappeared as well. So it was some force that that rope had ultimately pulled the underwater equipment off. To this day, we still call it the owner, Rudderless Dave.
Brownie. Uh, I've been on the boat all summer filming. Miss, I've been on my boat six years. I'm not that brown, though. Oh, you are. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not. Yeah, you are. I know it's your boat. All right. Roshi. 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 Thank you. Roshi. Yeah, thank you. All right. I know it's your boat. All right. Roshi. Roshi. Come on, cameraman. Ah. 